Well, thank you. Uh, you know, it's such an honor and a privilege to come and, and open with prayer this morning to bring a good spirit. You know, whenever I come into this place here, uh, I can feel the spirit of our elders here very much. And, uh, you know, the, it makes me feel good at heart to come and open with a prayer this morning, especially when we're going to be hearing of the work that we have done and the work that we still have to do as uh, educators and as workers you know, for uh, the young ones here, you know, our children are the, the important ones that we do this work for. And so when I asked for, uh, asked to do a prayer this morning, I accepted this tobacco in a good way, you know, and I hold it near to my heart so that as we uh, offer this tobacco, uh, you know, uh, back to Creator, uh, back to Mother Earth, that, uh, you know, uh, that we know that our, our ancestors are very much with us. The spirit of our people is very, very strong. And uh, we know that some of the work that we still have to do is going to require that good, strong spirit, the spirit of our women and of our men, and, uh, and a ceremony as well, and as well uh, to uh, open up uh, our spirits. You know, uh, the work that the churches are doing is uh, wonderful work that, uh, that is being done. And so I ask that the Creator bless us this morning with a good spirit, that we would feel that spirit uh, among us here. And uh, as we move forward and do another report uh, of the progress that we are making, that when we come back again, that we know that the impacts that we are uh, feeling uh, are positive impacts uh, for the children that we're doing it for, because uh, it is the little ones. Uh, when I uh, want to know what's going on in school, I ask my older granddaughter who is in grade 12, and then I turn to my young granddaughter, the youngest of our family of grandchildren, and uh, who is in kindergarten, and I ask them how it's going, you know. And when I hear the good things about language uh, programs, language development, and, and, and the, the cultural, the land-based teachings that, that uh, we embark on, I feel good about that. And when I see and I, I, I read the reports about the changing winds that we have, you know, in the Ojibwe uh, prayer, we, we, uh, we turn to the east, you know, and we, we look to the east uh, for where that new birth uh, comes, you know, and we, 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 we call upon that sun and that moon and the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the birthplace. Uh, you know, to be our guiding force, uh, our, and, and we turn to the south and we give thanks to the south, you know, for our physical health. And uh, we say thank you, Creator, for that physical health that you, we, we've been given so we can go on and do this work. Of course, we turn to the West and we, we uh, call upon our ancestors, the wisdom keepers, the knowledge keepers that we pray to and ask them to be with us here too. And then we turn to the North and we just thank uh, the, the uh, give our prayers and thanks for the North from where a lot of resources come and you know where we learn so much about ourselves uh, those uh, of us that are from the north, you know, we, we turn to the north. And then we turn back to ourselves and we look at our own uh, spirits, our own hearts, and we examine those hearts together this morning and in the, in the work to be done. And we give thanks for that good spirit uh, that we have in us uh, as men and women uh, so that when we go and educate our children, we can educate them in a good way so that they too can learn the good things about life that we have experienced, you know, in, bring, in bringing us together you know, there is a place and a time for everything, is what the scriptures talk about. And there is a place here now for us to continue to work and to continue that work in a good way with the guiding spirit. You know, that's what it's about. Kitchi Manitou, we call upon you this morning for that guiding spirit that you have given us uh, over the years and for the work that still needs to be done. We thank you for this place uh, here, uh, this very sacred place uh, that we come together here uh, that we, would, we know the stories of our people and, and how it impacts the lives of our children and of, of myself as an elder, I, I call upon you, Grace Spirit, that you would, we would feel that, uh, that good spirit here, that we would uh, go forward and, uh, and do the work that we can do in the best way we can. So I give thanks this morning as I accepted this tobacco in that way. Be which, amen. Mm. Thank you, Norman. Um, so back to 2015, take you back to 2015 in Ottawa, when the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada uh, Chair Murray Sinclair, Senator Justice Murray Sinclair, released the 94 Calls to Action. And at that time, Kairos accepted the challenge that the commissioners presented us with 
to try and respond by taking on one of those calls to action. And the one that Kairos chose at that time was call to action 62.1, which is also called Education for Reconciliation. And it's the call to action that, uh, that urges governments, the provincial and territorial governments, to work with indigenous peoples to imp develop and implement curriculum from kindergarten to grade 12 that uh, looks at residential schools, treaties, and the contributions of indigenous peoples to contemporary and historical Canadian society. So Kairos did that. And one way that it, it, it tackled that call to action was by going across the country and assessing how every jurisdiction was complying with call to action 62.1. And in October of that year, a few months later, we released a report card. And we updated that report card once in April of 2016. What we're gonna do today is announce another update to that report card. So starting in last fall, or almost a year ago actually, a group of researchers came together from the University of Ottawa and Carleton University and started to look at how jurisdictions had moved forward in terms of their compliance with Call to Action 62.1. And to help us sort of like uh, make that announcement today, uh, we're gonna have uh, the director of the National Center, Ryan Moran, and the executive director of Kairos, Jennifer Henry, say a few words. And then Jennifer and Rye are gonna be part of a panel that includes Elder Norman and Jennifer Lamaru from uh, the, Oak, the Seven Oak School Division here in Ottawa. So what I'm gonna ask here in Winnipeg, I'm from Ottawa. <laughs> I'm, but I, I'm really glad to be in Winnipeg, don't get me wrong. <laughs> Um, so what I'm going to ask is Rye and Jennifer to come up now and uh, have a seat here. I'm going to ask Rye to sort of say a few words first. I know Rye is not someone who doesn't need much of an introduction, but I'm going to say we'll give one anyways because that's part of my job as a Master of Ceremony. <laughs> so, um, so Rye is a proud member of the Red River Métis and, um, and as the director of the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation, it's Rye's job to guide its development, growth and reach. He came to the Centre from the Truth and Reconciliation of Canada, where he was Director of Statement Gathering and the National Research Centre. So while at the TRC, Rye facilitated the gathering of nearly 7,000 video and audio recordings of statements from former residential school survivors and others affected by the residential school system. He was also responsible for gathering the documentary history of the residential school system from more than 20 government departments and nearly 100 church archives. What we're talking about is hundreds of thousands, if not millions of records in all. Rye is a recipient of the Governor General's Meritorious Service Cross and a National Aboriginal Role Model Award. And before the TRC, he was active in many areas, including indigenous language preservation and the arts, specifically music. So it is an honor and a privilege to introduce uh, Ryan Moran. Thank you very much, Ed, and uh, thank you, Norman, as always, for your wonderful words this morning. I think it's it's really important to take a step back for a second, as, as Ed did, and, and understand why we're together in this room today and how we have been called upon to establish and maintain respectful relationships in this country. That concept of establishing and maintaining respectful relationships is the very definition that the TRC used to describe reconciliation. And that comes from a long line of, of Indigenous elders, Indigenous knowledge, Indigenous wisdom that has been shared and, and reiterated time and time and time again in this country through the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples, through treaties, through international work at the United Nations level. The establishment and maintenance of mutually respectful relationships requires establishing respectful relationships with the past, the present, and the future. And until we rectify the great imbalances in the presentation of history, in how we teach our students in this country, and how we share information with them, we will remain uh, at peril as a nation. 
because we need the truth. And truth absolutely has to precede the reconciliation work that we do. In bringing it, us all here today, I really want to celebrate the good work of, of Kairos in leading the development of this report card. Central in any relationship is accountability. Central in any relationship is saying, I want to see you succeed, but sometimes I need you to do more, or that you're doing a great job, and here's some ways that we can encourage you to aspire to reach greater heights. Uh, that's, I think, in many ways, what has happened in this report card, is this critical accountability piece that is so necessary in establishing these relationships. Reconciliation is not guaranteed in this country. It can not succeed. We have seen examples of that throughout the country's history. And we have all been issued a very powerful call to action, a collective call to action at the individual, at the collective, and at the national level to ensure this time that we do not fail. Because the stakes, frankly, are too high. So in creating this report card, I think what has been offered to the country is that opportunity to pause, to reflect, to assess, and to reassess the actions that we're taking. And central in this is that this mutual accountability framework has to continue. We can't stop here because it is only us as Canadian citizens, it is only us as the very humble 35 million people or so in this country that are actually going to ensure reconciliation occurs. And we have to remember now that reconciliation is in the national interest. This is something that will build a better Canada for all Canadians so that certain members of society are not left behind, so that the land is properly respected, so that Indigenous people see themselves not only in the textbooks, but also as a vibrant and meaningful part of the very framework of Canadian society. So I want to thank you all for coming here today, and I want to especially congratulate the good work of Kairos and to all the people that have participated in developing this report card. And most importantly, I wish you continued success in your ongoing work because you've contributed a lot already through the blanket exercise and a host of other very important exercises to this field of reconciliation education and thank you for your ongoing commitment to this because we need you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Rai. Um, when I mentioned that uh, Kairos was at the, in Ottawa, in 2015 when the commissioners released the calls to action and um, Kairos was there too in December of that year in Ottawa when the, the final report was released and for those of you who may have been around about 20 years ago when the report of the Royal Commission was released it was very similar feeling there was a lot of excitement a lot of anticipation positive energy and that's one of the reasons why Kairos chose to take this path, was to make sure that this time, that energy and enthusiasm didn't dissipate after a few years. Because the uh, energy that was there when the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples Report was released didn't last very long, or at least not as long as many of us were hoping it would. And so in taking on this task of bringing uh, raising up 62.1, one of the things Kairos was trying to do was keep it in front of the public eye. And now I'd like to call on uh, Jennifer Henry, um, who has been the executive director of Kairos since 2012. This year, she celebrates 25 years, uh, a quarter century uh, of working <laughs> in social justice. <laughs> I was going to say birthday, but that wouldn't quite... Uh, so Jennifer had the honor of being an ecumenical witness at six of the seven national events of the TRC. She serves on the Primates Commission, on the Doctrine of Discovery, Reconciliation and Justice, and on the board of the Center and Library of the Bible and Social Justice. She remains an activist and educator at heart. She was raised here on Treaty 1 territory. She has a Bachelor of Arts and a Bachelor of Social Work from the University of Manitoba. 
and a master's in social work and a master's of theological studies from the University of Toronto. So it's my pleasure to welcome it. Jennifer Henry. I am uh, so deeply grateful to be home here on Treaty One territory, and I just want to thank Norman very much for your words, Elder Norman, to uh, welcome us and open us in a good way, and, and just a real thank you to the hospitality of the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation, to Rai, and, and to all the staff who've been so uh, warm and welcoming to us here as well. It is important to begin with the truth, and it is the courageous testimony of the residential school survivors that gave us that truth, and we always have to start there, I think, because it's out of that truth that the commissioners challenged the country with the calls of action. So it's, it's very right to be here, which is the place of survivors, as we report on call to action uh, 62-1, and to try to be accountable back to those survivors for this call and what's happening uh, with respect to this call across the country. What we have to say is largely a good news story, that our schools across the country in every province and territory are taking positive steps towards implementing age-appropriate curriculum on residential schools, on treaties, and the historical and contemporary contributions of Indigenous people to Canada from kindergarten to grade 12. Since 2016, when we did the first baseline report, we really have seen a positive steps forward in all provinces and territories. And an example, given our presence here uh, in Manitoba, we recognize that social studies now mandatory from grade one to grade 11 covers treaties, residential schools, and the contribution of Indigenous peoples and that curriculum has been developed with Indigenous peoples via the First Nations, Métis, and Inuit education policy framework. And this and other steps moves Manitoba to one of the strongest ratings, both on public commitment and on implementation. But when we look all across the country, there are some things that we can observe. That there is still underrepresentation of Métis and Inuit experience in some of the programs except in the north where there's underrepresentation of Métis and First Nations experience. That there's very little focus on relevant content for the kindergarten level at the very beginning of our children's lives in the schools. That there's a lot more coverage of residential schools and treaties, but less on inclusion of historical and contemporary contributions of Indigenous peoples. And this represents something that needs much more emphasis and development. And it's absolutely essential because this is the story of resiliency and contribution and gift. And it's a story that needs to be told as we, as we speak about our country. And finally, to get to successful implementation, we need more Indigenous teachers and administrators in the education system. And we also need more training cultural competency, anti-racist training for non-Indigenous teachers and staff in the system to make this really come to life. Now what's critical to say is that this progress did not come out of the air. It was because of the truth of survivors. It was because of the challenge of commissioners. It's because of Indigenous leadership, passionate educators, dedicated students, ardent citizen advocates. And it came because there was pressure on legislatures and ministries to implement call to action TRC 62-1 in meaningful ways. And it's also important to say it has not been accomplished. There are still lots of gaps and there's much work to be done to fully implement this call and it will require continued pressure. All that strong work needs to continue. And it's critical to say that pressure will be needed to ensure that we do not move back. A few weeks ago, I was really pleased that my daughter was one of a bunch of young people across Ontario who walked out of class in a coordinated protest. And there was a lot of press attention to one of the foci of their protest, and that was contemporary self uh, health and sex education curriculum that had just been repealed by the new provincial government. But the very important story was also that the high school students were clear that there was another goal, the reestablishment of the Indigenous curriculum rewrite, 
work that had, was planned for the summer, a kind of phase two, that was abruptly canceled by the new provincial government. While the government says it will implement the updated curriculum and it claims to be committed to further developing supports with Indigenous people through other means, the students lacked confidence that this will be done and they pledged to hold the government of Ontario to account. This was their words, we the gov students will not stop, we will not relent, not until we win this fight. On another note, when an example of a very old an extremely offensive curriculum appeared in Alberta. It was a student who sounded the alarm and galvanized quick and strong outrage across the country. It's exactly that kind of passion, that kind of vigilance that's necessary to make sure progress continues to be made and we do not allow ourselves to fall back. And we invite all Canadians using our website to, do, um, to continue to keep up the pressure. We have an online tool that will allow you contact uh, your particular uh, legislators and ministries uh, from your province. Any retreat from meeting the goals of 62-1 is unacceptable. Increasingly, we're seeing non-Indigenous and Indigenous students working together to make this public stand for their own standard of education. And perhaps that's a sign in and of itself that change is happening both in knowledge and commitment. And so, to adults, we can't let them down. We have to make sure that we support this emerging leadership in all provinces and territories. If our young people are educated in the full spirit and intent of TRC 62, then our country will change. That's what the commissioners and the survivors knew. So this progress is important, but we also recognize that this is part of one of the 94 calls to action that require continued implementation by this nation to honor the courage of the survivors. We must stay the course. I want to thank you for your presence this morning. Thank you, thank you, Jennifer. Now I'd like to call up uh, Jennifer Lamoureux and uh, ask Norman to join us here at the front. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Jennifer to say a few words about uh, Call to Action 62.1, as someone who is the vice principal at Riverbend Community School, and an elementary school in the Seven Oaks School Division that houses a K-5 to Ojibwe bilingual program. Um, Jennifer has been, for over 10 years, uh, teaching in K-5 to schools and working with education-related organizations. As an ed educator, she welcomes the opportunity to share here knowledge and understanding of treaties, residential schools, and indigenous children's books, and the calls to action. In 2012, uh, Jennifer was recipient of the Aboriginal Circle of Educators Research and Curriculum Development Award, and she is co-author of the book, Warrior Women, Remaking Post-Secondary Places Through Relational Narrative Inquiry. Um, Jennifer grew up in Winnipeg, disconnected from her traditional culture and community, but she is proudly reclaiming her Anishinaabe culture through language and cultural events with her six-year-old daughter, Mina. So Jennifer, if uh, you want to say a few words about 52-1. Okay, yeah. sure. <laughs> yep, I can give her this one. Okay. Yeah. Hello. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I didn't prepare anything ahead of time because I didn't really know exactly how this would work, but um, I'm glad to be invited today. Um, so thank you for having me. Um, as Ed said, I've been working for 10 years as a teacher um, here in Manitoba, and I've always made it my goal to ensure that um, indigenous history is taught, um, or that indigenous perspectives are, are there in the teaching of Canadian history, because it really is all of our history. Um, I'm happy to see that we are getting a good grade here in Manitoba. Um, I know that I'm, I'm very fortunate to be working for a school division um, that has made it a mandate, that is very committed to teaching indigenous perspectives, to 
um, ensuring that it's infused in all of the curriculums in all of our schools. Um, so it is very present, and I feel like we are, we are on a really, really good path. Um, it is true that we don't want, we don't want um, this, this good movement, like this movement forward to, to die down. Um, and I would agree that we need to keep talking about it and sharing our, you know, celebrating the good work that's being done, but just to also give the message that there is more to do. Um, you know, I see a lot of good work being done by teachers and administrators in my school division, um, and I kind of wondered, how, how are things going with the province? And when I looked at the curriculums that are there, um, I'm, you know, I'm glad to see some things in print, um, but really it's the work of the teachers, and it's really the people who are in the front lines who, who are doing the work and who are making the change. You know, a curriculum is not really any good unless there's somebody who is working with that curriculum. Um, and then there's, you know, on the other hand, that there is more work to be done. There's a lot of people who don't have the knowledge um, or the experience to be able to teach curriculums that are there, um, and or even to to be um, be to be a leader in this in this area of reconciliation. So it is necessary to continue to work with teachers. Um, on creating curriculums that people can access and resources. Um, I remember hearing a video um, that Senator Murray Sinclair, where, where he talks about reconciliation and he talks about the fact that, you know, it's going to take a while. <laughs> um, and, and that's a good reminder for me that it is going to take a while. Um, but it does get hard. You know, it becomes difficult sometimes when you when you know there's a lot of work to be done, um, but as my husband, Kevin Lamro has always reminded me, um, and that I hear the words here today at the Center, National Center of Truth and Reconciliation, that reconciliation is a gift that, our, that the survivors gave to us by telling their stories, and that we must honor that and, and keep the work moving forward. So, miigwech. Thank you, Jennifer. Not bad, considering you didn't know you were going to say anything. <laughs> um, finally, I just want to uh, give um, a little, give us all a little bit more information about Norman, um, um, and give him a chance too to sort of like give us a little bit of his reflection on the call to action 62-1 and the calls to action in general, and reconciliation in Canada. Um, Norman is an elder in residence at the University of Manitoba. He was born in Bisset, grew up in the Métis settlement of Mani, Mani Goltagan, and in the early 60s worked in the gold mines in Bisset. In the mid-70s, he began a 26-year career working in the provincial government. He was executive director of the Northern Association of Community Councils and a Métis service officer for the Manitoba Métis Federation. He is active in the community as an elder and a pastor and, a, and is a member of several boards belonging to the city of Winnipeg. And he's also an avid curler and the founder of the Aboriginal Curling League of Winnipeg. Oh, geez, we're most impressed by that one. <laughs> um, in 1967, uh, Norman married Thelma Barker of Hollow Water First Nation and they have two children and six grandchildren. So once again, let's welcome Norman. And uh, Norman, if you'd like to share a few words. And then after Norman's done, we'll open it up for questions to the panel. Question, a little bit of a discussion. Uh, thank you uh, again for uh, introducing me and uh, telling a little bit about my life. Uh, you know, uh, at one point uh, in my early life, uh, when I was looking for uh, spiritual, uh, my spirit. Uh, I was having difficulty uh, finding my spirit uh, where I thought I would find it. Uh, we, I grew up as a Catholic uh, boy and uh, in the church, the Catholic church, and I was having a little trouble finding my spirit there. Uh, so I went to uh, the land uh, where uh, in my early life when we grew up in Manicotagan, uh, in the uh, in uh, the bush and by the river. Uh, I had uh, no trouble finding my spirit of who I was uh, when I was in nature. And uh, that's why I believe uh, strongly in, uh, in uh, land-based education. Uh, 
or language-based education. Uh, but land-based education, I think, is so very important to our children. And when I uh, ask my little granddaughter, the one who goes to the school where you uh, are working, uh, she, she tells me that uh, she is learning her language. Uh, she's uh, part uh, Dakota and Ojibwe and, and Cree. And so uh, I really like that when she comes home and, 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 and recites words that she had learned at school. Uh, you know, uh, her Anishinaabe words or Dakota words, uh, and I really, I really like that. I think we're on the right track there. When I read the report card of, uh, you know, Kairos and, uh, and the work that they do, I was very touched by that report card because as a pastor, you know, um, I, uh, I know that the spirit uh, of our people, um, and I think Kairos is uh, one of the organizations that really acknowledged that the spirit of our people is in the ancestors of our people, those that have been there before. Uh, for me as a pastor and as an elder now, I don't have to worry about uh, creating new pathways. The pathways are already there for, for us. We have to follow them. You know, and when I think, uh, when I teach about uh, faith, you know, uh, to be faithful in the work that we do. You know, faith is something that we hope for, but the evidence of it not yet seen. But the evidence of it is being seen here today in that report card. And, and, and I like that. And I, I say, you know, we're on the right track. Uh, that faith will take us to the places we want to go. But we have to keep our spirits strong. And uh, as we uh, uh, go about and doing our work, I know that we will find that. I always pray for the togetherness spirit because together we can get things done. Uh, alone, sometimes the road gets a little lonely. But together we can do things uh, and go further uh, and, and, and supporting each other in the work that we do. So I say miigwech uh, today uh, to, uh, for the educators. Uh, my wife, uh, you know, as an educator for many, many years, and still even today, she's an educator and uh, working with elders and seniors. And I, I really I do need to, uh, uh, it's a good reminder for us that uh, the women among us, you know, uh, my wife and my daughter, my granddaughters, my little great-granddaughter, the youngest of our family, is the one that I turn to for a lot of the spirit that I need as I do my work as, a, as an elder, a male elder, and as a pastor, miigwech. Thank you, Norman. Okay, and so if now if there are any questions uh, for the, any of the panelists, if, if uh, you just could identify yourself and, and uh, identify who you're directing the question to or if it's a general question. Um, I have a question. My name is Leah Fonte, and um, I work in the Center for Advanced Teaching and Learning. Uh, what? Uh, I'm not Lita. <laughs> Sorry, no. Um, but uh, implementation needs improvement on this background. Can you discuss that a little bit? So I think one of the things that we found in, across the country is very much what Jennifer was saying, that while the teachers may have a curriculum in front, maybe they don't always feel confident in, uh, in, in offering that curriculum. So that might be non-Indigenous teachers who are uh, feeling like they don't have the competency to, to address the curriculum in, in a good way. They're feeling out of their their league, and that that felt that com comes up across the country, where in Alberta, for example, where there's very strong uh, curriculum, a sense from some of the teachers that they're reluctant, they're un they're not necessarily comfortable. So I think that's that continued work of having to address those kinds of things. But Jennifer, I think you could speak to. But this. I just want to just before we go there, I think yeah. Leah, I just wanted to point out that that if you're looking at the report card. Yeah that you'll see that the needs improvement was the last report card. Mm -hmm. oh, that in okay. fact, mm -hmm. that in fact now Manitoba has progressed to an excellent grade in terms of implementation. But the, but the, the details that Jennifer mentioned were, were some of the reasons why in 2016 they, they got that um, rating. Yeah. And I think it's significant to notice that, uh, that not just that, that Manitoba has received excellent grading, both in commitment and implementation, but how far it's gone in only two years. 
And that's what we're trying to emphasize here with the report card. It's the progress that is being made yeah. and the ongoing commitment that is obviously there and how, like when we learned from Jennifer, this Jennifer on this side, yeah. how <laughs> it's obvious that the school's divisions are taking it seriously. And that's what we wanted to really emphasize and underline here. Well, I would just say that, yes, it says excellent rating, um, but I also think that it continues to need improvement that, you know, just because it says excellent doesn't mean we're done. Um, and I don't know enough about the actual report card. And as a teacher, you're always skeptical. Like, what, is, what are we actually saying when we're writing this down? And what are people actually thinking when we say this? So, yes, of course, there, there still needs to be um, more implementation. Um, and yeah, I think that there's a lot of teachers who are not necessarily comfortable um, because there are some difficult conversations that need to be had um, when you teach the true history, when you teach the truth. Um, and these are teachers who have grown up without that information um, and are now having to have difficult conversations inside classrooms so that, that you know, they might not be completely prepared. Uh, both Indigenous and non-Indigenous um, teachers, I'd say. Um, yeah, so there's there's work to be done on that front for sure. Um, yeah, I don't. Yeah. Oh yeah, I think I think you've raised something really important in terms of the excellent grade as well. And I think what we do need to do is we need to to frame where this report card is coming out at a particular moment in time in history. And I think the exciting thing that we can recognize is that. The future remains as yet unwritten. And if we do this education work now, if we start really having these honest conversations, we have the potential to realize something that we've never seen before in this country. So the, the Canada that we're building 20, 30, 40 years out is the Canada that we're starting with now. And at least these kids, I think what's happening now is at least they are having a much better sense that Canada itself is a, is a highly imperfect nation and that it has substantial work to do to just re recognize basic human rights. Mm -hmm. And if we can start recognizing and affirming that Indigenous peoples do, in fact, have, it, have human rights and that we're an essential part of this country, you know, the work that Norman was talking about, about land-based education, about, you know, full incorporation of Indigenous languages, you know, for all students, you know, in a, in a, uh, in a classroom, we're not there yet. But this is how we need to approach the work now in order to realize that goal uh, down the road. Yeah, because what's it, in um, 2017 I may graduate with a B Bachelor of Education here. And it's just the, um, I think that's the department that really needs some um, education in there. Because there's a lot of students in there going through there not knowing our history at all. And that's uh, it's quite concerning for me at the time, um, but I think the one way to implement that is to go to the education departments and post-secondary education. Because we're talking about K-12, to but we're not talking about post-secondary either. That really needs to try to get on the wagon. I, and I think that's one of the big challenges vis-a-vis -vis education in the country, is that when you look at the TRC's calls to action holistically, it does imagine a transformational step change in how we approach education overall in this country. So there are calls to action that relate to the K-12 system. There's calls to action that relate to post-secondary institutions. There's calls to action that relate to public servants that are making the decisions and the policies on what happens inside of schools. There's education on newcomers as we welcome newcomers to the country. Uh, there's education for businesses that are called for. And then there's all of the specific kind of frontline areas that are specifically targeted in terms of health, law, social work, so on and so forth. So that is the complexity of this change that we're trying to go through. And one can't happen without the other. We, we need public servants. We need, we need the people that are teaching educators to rectify their imbalances. Um, in order to ensure that we're putting the children at the center of the conversation yeah. and that those children are given the full opportunity and ability to really understand what it means to be Canadian in, in today's time. I want to add something else. 
I just wanted to add to the conversation again about implementation and I know we're talking about implementing a curriculum and sometimes I think that uh, curriculum is a little bit slow to come um, and the resources that go with it sometimes are a little bit slow to come to be able to support that. I think that the curriculum needs to be viewed as almost a living document and also um, you know, because we don't have a lot of Indigenous teachers and administrators in the school system, um, it kind of makes sense that, you know, when we're talking about Indigenous perspectives or Indigenous history, um, you know, those things that haven't been, been shared in schools, um, it kind of makes sense that, that people would be, you know, wouldn't have the experience necessarily to do, to do that. Um, I think we need to bring in our Indigenous brothers and sisters <laughs> into our schools. You know, we have, um, we're, I'm grateful in my school division to have two elders in, in residence in our division, and we also have two elders in our school as well for our Ojibwe bilingual um, students for our program there. Um, so I mean, really, like, how are, how are we going to learn about Indigenous people? How are we going to um, understand how to have those difficult conversations about our history if we're just looking at it from, what, from one perspective or from a document, right? So I think that bringing in our Indigenous brothers and sisters and family and friends into, into, our, into education um, will really help that implementation piece. That's a critical piece of this call was that it did say very clearly even the development of curriculum in consultation with Indigenous communities. And, um, and it's critically important because when that doesn't happen, it, it doesn't come out well. And so if you look at one of the poorer ratings, there's an improvement, but an improvement from a pretty poor starting place, that's Quebec. And in Quebec, part of the reason that, that it hasn't improved is because they aren't working effectively with Indigenous communities directly. So they, it means that what they have done, they've done it, is riddled with um, inaccuracies and bias that, uh, and so the critical piece of, at every part of this process, uh, having a direct uh, relationship with Indigenous communities. I, I can say I'm a parent of a high school student, and I remember growing up here, right? Going to school here. I remember what I didn't learn. <laughs> I remember the siloed communities where the only Indigenous communities, I grew up in a white sub suburb, the only Indigenous folks I knew were 60 scoop kids who were adopted into white homes. Um, there was so much racism. That's what I was taught. That's what I was taught. I go into my daughter's school. I see a beautiful image of a jingle de dress dancer. I see an incredible uh, piece on missing and murdered with red dresses. I see their, their art program only focused on Indigenous art. This is in a Toronto school. Um, and I just, I do see that we're making the progress. And, that, and this is a living document too. <laughs> because it's intended to help us keep looking to see that we are continuing to make progress and be absolutely sure that we're not falling behind. Because we need to encourage, all, all of us need to encourage each other to stay the course. And, and, and as I was saying before, this is only one of the calls. We need to also engage our children in all the calls so that they're working with us around holding the country to account uh, based on the truth that the survivors offered us. So we need to see more success stories. Yeah. Yeah, amongst our communities rather than, but it's kind of hard to, you're working in a system that does, doesn't seem to look at indigenous education as an equal mm. period, mm. right? You, you get to this point and then all of a sudden you're oppressed, right? And then you keep getting oppressed and it, it just layers and layers, but you're trying to break through. But it's also hard on the indigenous educators to try to forge ahead, but there's always that block, right? But we have to, well, we endured so much in our but you know, our history and my ancestors, but it's just that it's tired <laughs> going over those barriers all the time, right? Absolutely. But, yeah. I agree. I've I've felt that too as an indigenous educator and yeah. I'm you know, I'm just so grateful for the conversation to um, be able to frame it in terms of truth and reconciliation. Again, you know, thinking about um, their survivors 
and how they shared their story and what a gift that is. And, and when it gets hard, I always remember that. And the intergenerational support. Mm -hmm. We keep forgetting that the children have been affected, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and that keeps oh. going on until we... I haven't forgotten that myself. Yeah. <laughs> but, but that's it's because it's I live it. And yeah. Right. yeah, but it's just, you know, we forget that. Yeah, I really respect my mother was a residential survivor, but I also endured all that pain, too, growing up. So we're looking at our children's children who are passing that on, and we need to kind of stop that somewhere. We need to stop that cycle, because breaking on the adult sense of belonging, right? So we're trying to break these barriers, and it's just like, okay, uh, I'm trying to reach you, but something's telling me I can't, right? And I don't know what that is quite yet, but. Good, thank you, Leah. If I <laughs> that was a great question. You opened up a lot of discussion there. Yeah. There's another question right beside you. Um, I just had a quick question. I'm Ashley Press from the Winnipeg Free Press. I was wondering if you could tell me how many um, um, immersion schools for Indigenous languages there are in Manitoba, like um, what we're preventing is doing? Um, well, from what I know, um, just when I sort of took a survey last year, uh, well, we are a bilingual program, so not a not an immersion program, but a language program, right? So about about approximately fifty percent of the day is taught in the Anishinaabe language. I know that in Winnipeg School Division they have an immersion program, and I believe it's um, I think it's kindergarten is the immersion, and then there's a grade one that is bilingual. And then I believe in River East Transcona, they are not necessarily doing like a bilingual or immersion, but more, um, they are doing language, they do have language programming, um, but I don't really know very many other details about that. Are there more programs planned like this? Does anybody know? Not that I know at this moment. the two things to pick up. One is the, the, the consultation with Indigenous peoples and the creating of the program together through that framework, uh, but also that it's mandatory in social studies from the grade one to grade 11. So the program has been changed and that's a mandatory program. So it, we tried to pick up on all the key points of the actual call and those were mandatory from K to 12 and then speaking to those three areas, right? Residential schools, treaties, and the contributions of, of First Nations Inuit and Métis to Canada. So we tried to look at that. So Canada, so Manitoba was advancing in those, uh, the majority of those areas, both at the public commitment line and the implementation line. But even an excellent rating, as is identified here, is identified as you're on the path to meeting this call to action. And we still need to work together to make sure that it's fully implemented. So excellent is uh, not perfect. It's excellent. <laughs> and, and actually, when we were putting the, the grading system together, as you can imagine, there was a lot of discussion around, do we use letters? Do we use numbers? Do we use words? And we sort of settled on, on the words um, because we felt they were more descriptive in terms of being more helpful in, in terms of like indicating where, in what direction the jurisdiction was going. And we had some talk about should we use excellent or not because do people interpret excellent as meaning that's it, it it's, everything's been done. And I'm glad that Jennifer brought it up that it doesn't mean that everything's been done. It means in part that there, there are a lot of right things are being done compared to other jurisdictions across the country. It's, it's really excellent, but of course it's not over yet and there's still a long way to go. I'd like to uh, just add a little bit and say that uh, I'm not surprised as an elder that, uh, you know, Manitoba is kind of uh, leading the way in, 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 in the work that we're doing and reconciliation, being that, you know, we are the center of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Turtle Island, uh, you know, uh, Manitoba, Manitoba Bay, where the spirit rests. You know, I think that it's uh, really important that we acknowledge that work that uh, we do in, in this place, uh, you know, Manitoba. 
uh, you know, we know that uh, the spirit has to be with us in whatever we do. And so when we're that close to the center, you know, the medicine wheel would teach us that we are in the right place, not only geographically, but at the right time in this place, that Manitoba would lead in, in the work that has to be done in way of reconciliation. It also doesn't surprise me that, uh, you know, uh, I'll say my cousin, he is, uh, that uh, Senator Murray Sinclair, uh, you know, kind of leading the way, uh, leading uh, that, uh, uh, being one of the, the commissioners that he is from here and that he brings us back and grounds us in some of these, the work that needs to be done. Uh, never allowing us to forget that education is a process. It's a, a process that has uh, brought in, 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 you know, some damage, uh, results in, in some uh, damage that we are uh, now on the road to repairing and that uh, we have to know that uh, to be grounded spiritually, that you have to be grounded not only in the traditional teachings, but that is important, but also to be grounded in the international, pardon me, in the intergenerational uh, way. Uh, I know when students come and sit with me in the elder's office here at the campus here, uh, you know, uh, the first question I ask them is if they know they're, who they are spiritually. Uh, who are you spiritually? Do you know that? You know, and, and, and many times after an hour or so uh, of uh, talking with them, uh, they, get, uh, uh, they get the idea of what I'm talking about when I ask them if you're, if, you're, if you're grounded spiritually because it's so important that our young people, you know, that our older students that are going, that are going to go on to the university level, uh, post-secondary, are grounded uh, because they always tell us that when you work with your young children between the age of 2 and 12, that they will always connect and reconnect to the spirit of who they are. And I think that is so very important. So thank you uh, again. Mm -hmm. And just a second question. Um, how concerned are you about Ontario, like you mentioned, now that they stopped the rewrite of the curriculum? Um, how concerned about, are you about their education for reconciliation going forward? I think everybody's probably got a lot to say about what's okay. happened on the Ontario. Um, I, I am concerned, and I think there's a lot of people that are concerned about it. And I think it is particularly concerning because it shows how fragile this work of reconciliation can be if leadership does not embrace the fundamental idea that reconciliation is necessary for building a better country. If we continue to maintain the idea that somehow we're going to lose out as a country by fully incorporating indigenous peoples, uh, and that, that has been the dominant narrative in this country, we are, we are heading to very difficult times. And, and so the, the rollback is, is concerning for two reasons. One, it shows the status of leadership, and two, it shows the, uh, or it affirms that kids in those systems may be denied their right to receive a proper and truthful and honest accounting of who we actually are. And the sad thing now is that we know what the truth is, we know what we need to do. Uh, at this point, not fully embracing these calls to action is simply turning a blind eye to that history. And it is uh, it is a, um, it's a continuation of a process that has been deemed to be, <coughs> frankly, intolerable and inexcusable in this country. And that's precisely what was said by the most senior elected officials when the apology was given, that the attitudes and ideals that led to the creation of the residential schools have no place in Canadian society, which means that the silencing of Indigenous voices and perspectives has no place in Canadian society. The alternate is inclusion and incorporation. <coughs> one last round. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, I was just going to say um, one of the things that, that happens. I, I used to be, I used to work for St. James Assembly School Division here in Winnipeg. And um, one of the things that happens is when you incorporate uh, Indigenous perspectives into the curriculum. Um, as well as bringing in cultural um, programming, as well as having talking circles and all, and all of the other stuff. 
um, I was the one that used to get um, the grades of all the students uh, from the whole school division. And what we saw at that time, um, I'm no longer, I don't work there anymore, but what we saw at that time was the academic achievement of the, of the students go up, mm -hmm. right? Because they were actually learning something that they could um, identify with, mm -hmm. right? And they were becoming proud of their traditions and their culture because they were learning the study of sacred teachings and, 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 and all of the other things that the elders would come and teach. And, and so I'm not surprised that um, Manitoba specifically would have um, a better grade because that's been going on for for many, many years mm -hmm. when I was around. And, and so um, and I'm hoping that with this report that as it goes across Canada, um, um, maybe the next report you can say, you know, just how it has impacted students. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and exactly um, where they were before to where they are currently, yeah. right? And I think that currently, they're in a much better place uh, stored in, uh, in terms of their own education and understanding of who they are as Indigenous kids. Yeah, so just briefly, I just want to pick that point up. I, I, we, we did a survey using what was accessible to us um, across this country, and there, there could be some really good research done here, specifically on that question of effectiveness. Mm -hmm. So how is the implementation moving forward, but how, how is it changing? And how is it changing indigenous kids' experience, and how is it changing non-indigenous and newcomer kids' experience? Uh, because we, re we as a country repressed indigenous teaching, and, and that, the possibility of bringing that back to benefit both indigenous kids and the whole of the community, that, that's an incredible, powerful, uh, hopeful moment, I think, for us as a country. So I just, I just want to lift up that we, we could use some researchers to look at effectiveness. That's certainly beyond our capacity. Well, well, one of the, I'm sorry, one of the other things that had happened at that time was that in, in this one school that had actually was implementing uh, indigenous perspective into the, its, all of its curriculum, um, the um, racist and um, fights between indigenous and non-indigenous people plummeted, mm -hmm. right? Because the non-indigenous kids were learning about indigenous perspectives, and, and so there was hardly any, there was some, there was hardly any racist um, comments or fights. Right? So that's one of the, one of the things that, that happens when you implement something that's, that's good. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. If, if there are no other questions, um, I'm just going to wrap this up with a heartfelt thank you to the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation for hosting this event and for Rye for participating. Norman, thank you again for your opening and for all the wisdom you've shared with us. Jennifer, sorry for putting you on the spot this morning, but I'm really, I'm really glad you were here. And Jennifer Henry, of course, very much appreciated your participation. So thank you again, everyone, for joining us here today and for sharing in what I think is very good news going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you.